in the 60s, uh, this thing called the Jesus Movement was in full swing. There are all kinds of uh, hippies in particular who were searching for God, searching for whatever they thought would satisfy them, uh, high on drugs, high on sex. Uh, and yet among them, nonetheless, there were people who had a genuine hunger. Uh, they wound up, many of them, coming to uh, places where the gospel was being preached by hippies and taught uh, by people like uh, Chuck Smith at Calvary Chapel, Costa Mesa. Out of uh, that Calvary Chapel, uh, Jesus uh, movement came a number of other uh, church movements. Uh, we, Joni and I, went up to West LA and started the first uh, vineyard out from Calvary Chapel. In 1974, we began with uh, a small Bible study in uh, Chuck Gerard's home. Chuck was the lead singer of a Jesus movement band called Love Song. In the first week we had five people, then 15, then 30, and then it just exploded. Uh, interestingly, all I really knew how to do was sit in a stool, uh, teach the Bible as well as I could, uh, and play guitar with three chords. You could play almost any song with three chords in those days. And that seems to be all God needed. Before we knew it, we had 200 people in our living room, and every week uh, dozens coming to know Jesus, including many celebrities whom we didn't know were celebrities because we were so naive and innocent uh, that we had no clue who was coming. After meeting in our living room for a brief period of time, we moved into a gym, out through the gym. We were gonna rent another building, but it wasn't available at the last minute, and so we decided to meet at the beach one Sunday uh, where we have our baptisms. And uh, everybody loved it so much at the beach, they said, can we meet here next week? Well, long story short, a year later, we're still meeting at the beach. Hundreds of people have come to know Christ that would never have gone to a building. The lifeguard came to Christ. We had baptisms every Sunday. Uh, and uh, I look back on that now and see that it was the hand of God that led us to the beach to reach people that wouldn't have been reached any other uh, way. Meanwhile, the, the Fultons and Wimbers uh, were becoming part of Calvary Chapel. Uh, after being part of Calvary for a brief time, I met them in 1979 when John was teaching at a Calvary conference at Twin Peaks uh, in California and was incredibly drawn to his heart, uh, to Carol's humor, uh, and to his capacity to communicate the kingdom of God in ways I'd never heard before. And we became uh, best close friends. Uh, John and Carol reached out to Joni and to me we spent enormous amounts of time just having great fun, but always winding up talking about sharing Jesus. In 1982, some three years later, it was clear to me that his gifts and, and ministry, his anointing, his calling, his measure, uh, his training was so far superior to mine that it just really made sense to, to take the little seed God had given us and give it to John so that he could take it uh, the rest of the way that it was supposed to go. I come to his hotel room in Washington, D.C., where John is doing some conferencing. And, and I, I mean, we knew one another, but I had never really spent much time alone with him. And I get to the door, and he greets me. How was your flight? Blah, blah, blah. And, and uh, he said, in the first 30 seconds, I need to confess something to you, brother. So I said, oh, okay, John. And he said, last night I was sitting here in the room, and I'm flipping through the set, and um, there was a sex scene on television. And I just sat there transfixed for several minutes before I found the strength to turn it off. And, and I know that the Holy Spirit just wants me to get this out and be accountable and clean about it. So uh, you're the one that I need to do it with. So I'm sorry, I ask your forgiveness. And I was overwhelmed. I just thought, he's 25 years older than me. I, he doesn't really know me. He doesn't need to do this. He could have easily presented a, a really strong front. And here he is in his mid-50s confessing something that was really embarrassing to a 30-year-old. And I thought, this is the kind of person I want to be like. It's just great. John was very spontaneous. And one time we were in Switzerland. This is a conference, several thousand people. And right before the conference, he says to me, do you remember that quote you told me from Calvin the other day? And I go, yeah, it's, and I, you know, reeled it off to him. And he says, to, he, he goes, oh, that's good. He stands up in front of several thousand people, relates the quote, and then preaches his whole message out of the quote. <laughs> I was just sitting there in shock thinking, how did he do that? 
I remember being in these meetings and the swirl of stuff and the heat of the discussions and Carol Wimber sitting in a comfy chair someplace in the room with this afghan. She'd start an afghan at the beginning of the meetings and she'd just crochet and crochet and crochet all the way through the meetings though nothing was going on. It just all kind of swirled around her and she'd and she'd be creating these. And there was actually something very comforting about that because at the beginning of a church or the beginning of a movement, there's all this chaos. And it's you, there's just no way around that. That's just the way it is. It was very, very calming, just that sense of this is not out of control. And every once in a while, she'd just her head would pop up and she'd say something really profound. I think John operated out of the knowledge that the answer to misuse is almost never no use. The answer to misuse is right use. And so while John was very aware of excesses or misuses concerning the Holy Spirit, he just instinctually knew that the answer wasn't then to have sort of nothing to do with the Holy Spirit. The answer was to find right use and to find a way to interact with the person and work of the Holy Spirit. John had this phrase about being naturally supernatural. And I just think if you, know, if you had to sort of boil all this down to a phrase, that was a fantastic phrase. Because what John was envisioning was a way of interacting with the Holy Spirit that wasn't goofy or weird. It was natural, but simultaneously, and this isn't the greatest word, supernatural, meaning it had this distinct kind of other than human reality that God was actually with you. And we walked into the auditorium of Canyon, well, it's a high school, it was a gymnasium, Canyon High School. And uh, the band was playing and we just sat down and the words to the songs were so intimate and personal and they were directed toward God and His presence was so strong, I just sat there and cried the whole time. And it was that way every time we went. I was so dried and worn out and felt so far away from God and I felt like this is a place where God is. And it was awesome to be in His presence. Really what I'd always intrinsically believed in my heart was what the church was all about. And I feel like I finally found a family, a place that I belonged. I was brand new. Nobody knew who I was. I mean, I'd only been there one other time that morning. And I had a bunch of college-age students approach me and ask me if they could pray for me. They actually kind of circled around me, laid their hands on me. And I just began to weep and weep and weep for the first time ever receiving prayer. I mean, I just cried and cried, and I had no idea what was happening to me. I look back now and I realize that was the Holy Spirit. And it was the first time that I had actually felt the presence of the Holy Spirit. And so that to me was just priceless. Like I'd never experienced that anywhere else, and I, and I knew that I wanted more of that. I didn't know what to think. I mean, here are 2,000 people sitting in there singing for a half hour, no overheads, no lyric sheets, no nothing, and everybody's crying. What should I think about that? I mean, I didn't know what to think. It was the presence of the Lord in the midst of his people. Uh, you, you know, and, and I, I think I could figure that out, but that was about it. In the late 70s, there was a song written called, uh, the song was called Isn't He, written by John Wimber. Uh, John and, and the team introduced it in Anaheim uh, on a Sunday. Uh, a couple weeks later, John Wimber was on a, a ministry trip to, uh, to South Africa. Uh, in the process of getting to South Africa, a plane was delayed. And so he didn't, he didn't show up in time for the first meeting. So he, you know, he wasn't there before the meeting. He walks into the middle of worship and the song that they're playing is Isn't He. That's a, you know, maybe one of the more dramatic examples of, of how songs, uh, how the vineyard songs have traveled, but uh, that's sort of telling. <laughs> the song Breathe was written by a, a worship leader by the name of Marie Barnett. They were having a, an extended time of worship and she started to spontaneously sing the song Breathe. Um, it just sort of happened in the context of the moment you know, was, you know, probably took as long to quote unquote write it as it, as it did for her to sing it. By the time, uh, you know, 2002 rolls around, you had uh, Rebecca St. James, a Christian artist, and Michael W. Smith both had a version of Breathe that were on the radio competing against one another for the number one spot on the, on, on the Christian radio charts at the time. So Marie won a songwriting award by uh, 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 ASCAP, which is a company that tracks uh, radio play and other things, a very you know, secular company, uh, and it won an award for the most recorded song of 2002. Not the most recorded Christian song, the most recorded song. That's an example of how songs, you know, our songs come from this real simple place of the local church, you know, just some people gathered worshiping, and you just, you know, the Lord has just taken that to impact, you know, impact the world in a very significant way.
every month we do shows in bars. We have like three different bands play, usually one that isn't a part of our church. And then we invite the whole city and we raise money for different organizations. It's so easy to invite people to a venue to watch music and then you just get to connect with people. By far, the number one thing people say is, I don't, are you allowed to do this? This is people that don't know Jesus that ask me this question. Are you sure you're allowed to do this? And my constant response is always, well, this is where Jesus was. He was always getting in trouble because he was in the wrong place with the wrong people. And so we want to be where Jesus is, with the, in the wrong place, with the wrong people, like you. <laughs> There's a couple that came to our church that had been kicked out of two churches because they had had two kids out of wedlock. You know, they weren't married. And they would come in the back of the church every week and just cry for like two months. And I could never get to them because I'd get done preaching and they would just escape. <laughs> They'd run away. And finally, one of the times I made it like my mission to get to them, and I jumped off the stage, I ran to the back door, and I grabbed them right before they left. I said, hi, I'm Jay, I haven't gotten to meet you. And they're wiping the tears off their face. And they said, what are you doing back here? I said, well, I wanted to meet you. I've seen you for two months. And they said, well, we just leave every week because we feel like we're losing our minds. We just cry every time. Every time you speak, every time there's music, every time we pray, we just cry. And we don't even know why. I said, that's God's spirit. And immediately they just had shame. And I said, well, do you not think you can receive from God or you can experience him? They said, well, we've been kicked out of two churches. And... But it was reversing that trend of shame for them to know that God accepted them right where they were at. And somehow our church was a safe place for them to experience that. That was just God's grace. I don't know that we did anything strategically. <laughs> it just happens. A woman in the church rebuked me for not telling them they were in sin. When are you going to tell them they're in sin? And I said, well, I'm not going to. As long as they want to come and sit in the back and cry, we will always make room for them. And then we had baptisms coming up. So she come up, came up and said, I was wondering if I could get my daughter baptized, a little baby. I said, why? She said, well, my grandma told me you have to. I said, why don't we meet and talk about it? So we sat down and talked, explained baptism. It's like dying and raising again. And we believe children, you know, need to make those decisions for themselves. And we could we'd do a dedication, not baptism, went through the whole thing. And right at the end of it, he, the, the boyfriend, the, they were living together, he said, well, then we should be baptized. I mean, we shouldn't be baptizing the baby. We should be baptized. I said, well, when you're baptized, it means you submit your whole life to Jesus. Everything, your sex life, your money, everything. That's what it means. Are you prepared to do that? And he said, well, we're already not having sex. A couple months ago, we heard you talk in a sermon about that. So we're not having sex. I mean, I moved in the other bedroom. So they're living together, moved into separate bedrooms under the conviction of hearing, you know, from the Lord. And so, so I said, well, then why wouldn't you just be married? He goes, oh, we just can't afford it, you know, and blah, blah, you know. So I said, well, I would want you to really consider marriage if you're going to get baptized because that, that's God's plan. We explained marriage, went through this long process. So anyway, so then he calls me 10 minutes later, says, because they separate. He goes, dude, you are totally blowing it. As soon as you said the thing about marriage, I thought I'm going to ask her to marry me right away. But then you keep yapping about it and it can't be a surprise. He said, so what I'd like permission from you is for the baptism can you get us up there and explain baptism? Because we had 20 some people getting baptized and I'll ask her to marry me in front of the church. It was powerful. And I said, I'll, I'll one up you. We would love to help pay for this ceremony. I want to make it work. So they lined all up. We did the dedication for the baby. And then he, I said, and I think uh, he has something to say before we do the baptism. Dropped to a knee, said, we want to give our whole lives to Jesus. And I want to start by asking you to marry me. And so then two weeks later, we did the wedding ceremony in the same place they were baptized. And at the reception, the same woman that rebuked me came up and said, well, I see you set him straight finally. I said, well, first I wanted to punch her. But besides that, I said, no, that's actually not what happened. God stirred them to, to get married.
because they wanted to cement their life together. One of the questions that we've been asking in our church and a lot of vineyards have been asking is, why are things the way they are? Why is this person hungry? And why do they need to come to our food pantry every week? Why are they not fully employed? Why don't, you know, why is the system stacked against them? And, and how did they get in this situation? And, and what is it about my privileges that maybe has hurt this person? And that's a very threatening question to Americans. Uh, there was a Central American priest who was murdered who said uh, about 25 years ago, you know, when I feed the hungry, people call me a saint. When I ask why are people hungry, people call me a Marxist. I represented Vineyard at a, at a retreat in uh, Georgia recently. Uh, with 27 of the top environmental scientists and top evangelical leaders. I was just there because I, I was Vineyard, and Vineyard is recognized as someone who's progressive and, you know, engaging the culture. The dean of the uh, School of Forestry and the Environment at Yale, the first scientist to advise a U.S. president on climate concerns back in the Carter um, uh, Carter administration stood up and he said, I used to think that the, you know, the main threats to, uh, to the global environment were climate change, biodiversity loss, and habitat destruction, but I was wrong. I thought if we threw good science at these problems, uh, we'd have them licked by now for sure. But we've been throwing good science at these problems for 30 years, and I'm realizing that our, the, the biggest threats are not climate change, biodiversity loss, habitat destruction. Our biggest challenge is selfishness, greed, and apathy. And we need a spiritual and cultural transformation, and we don't know how to do that. And, you know, I kind of looked at the room of evangelical leaders, including me and representing Vineyard, and he was like saying, we need your help. Vineyard is all about doing the stuff. You know, it's, a, it's an activist movement at its heart. And so I think just people in the culture are sick of all the talk and they're looking for some action. And vineyard churches are in a great position to actually wrap their arms around an issue and say, how does this translate into people doing something that actually makes a difference, you know? We've gone into to New Orleans and in the Gulf Coast area as a result of the hur Hurricane Katrina. And we've had thousands of people from all over the United States go down. We had, you know, nearly a million dollars that was raised that went in there, and people want to be involved. But some of them don't understand that this is a part of what it means to be a Christian, because they've been raised that being a Christian is you pray and you go to church and you fast occasionally and you pay your tithe. You don't feed the poor. You don't... Uh, uh, you're not concerned about social reconciliation. These are things that, you know, it's just kind of a dichotomy it's a, or a dualism where that's the world and we're going to be spiritual. You know, there's theologies that's kind of waiting until Jesus comes, you know, and, and uh, kind of letting the world go to hell while we wait for Jesus to come. The first mandate that God gave to, to humankind, Adam and Eve, was to care for the earth. And we have violated that commandment. We have learned to bring, call people to Christ without calling them to be disciples. Or we call them to be disciples to pray, to read their Bibles, to pay their tithe, and to go to church. But Jesus was engaged in issues much larger than that. If we're his disciples, we're out feeding the poor. We're out reaching out to those who are different than us and bringing them together. We're out caring for the earth. That's what it means to be a disciple of Jesus.